Hello everyone, I am Be Better Gamer. Welcome to Be Better Gamer Wrestling. This channel is dedicated to the classic series of N64 wrestling games developed by Aki Corporation, such as WCW NW World Tour, WCW NW Revenge, Virtual Pro Wrestling 64, Virtual Pro Wrestling 2, WWF WrestleMania 2000, and WWF No Mercy. I'm bringing you another Let's Play with WWF No Mercy, continuing my Hardcore Championship path. I'm pretty much halfway through the Hardcore Championship title paths, I guess you could say. And I am going to be doing this episode with The Undertaker, the American Badass Undertaker, Dead Man Inc. Undertaker. This isn't Fire and Brimstone Undertaker. This isn't the Ministry of Darkness Undertaker. This is secretly one of my favorite runs as the undertaker is when he adopted his american badass gimmick and that's when he did manage to win the hardcore championship from rob van dam who was the subject of my last let's play video so go check that out if you haven't rob van dam obviously not in wwf no mercy he was a call i had to make a creator wrestler and i uploaded the let's play with him and i also uploaded how to make rob van dam so go check that out Undertaker, on the other hand, is in the game, but they included him. So there's a lot of really cool things about this version of The Undertaker that's in WWF No Mercy, as opposed to the version of The Undertaker that was in WrestleMania 2000, which is more so centered around his Ministry of Darkness gimmick. And I'm going to get into that. I'm going to get into that, his hardcore championship run, and all that jazz. But first, I got to take care of a little bit of business that I didn't take care of last hardcore championship let's play. I promised one of my subscribers, Cecilia Pisano. Cecilia Pisano, I hope you're watching this. I hope you're listening. I mean, I know you are because you're always one of the first people to comment on my videos. I appreciate the love. I appreciate all the uh, comments that you bring me. And I meant to do a shout out. She wanted a shout out. So here's the shout out. But really, what's cool about Cecilia is that <laughs> the Cecilia always asks me, what's coming up next? What's the next video? What's the next Hardcore Championship? Who's after Who's after Taker? Who's after Hardcore Holly? Who's after Crash? When are you doing the Tag Team Championship? Who are you going to do? Who's the first team? Who's the second team? And it's kind of funny. I enjoy it. I like it because it forced, I've been working on a schedule to get my ass into gear to really make sure that I don't miss you know, too much time like I have done in the past. You know, in my 500 subscriber special video, I talk about, here we go, I'm going onto the table because this is a hardcore championship run. Got to do the last ride onto the table. I'm going to try to do that as much as I can in this championship path. You know, I did have to play as Undertaker to win the hardcore championship and then start. So this is him doing the hardcore championship path. I think I pretty much got to win every match for this title run. There he goes. Uh, the last ride. Change from the Tombstone Pile Driver. You can't do the Tombstone Pile Driver with Undertaker. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. But let me get back to Cecilia Pisano. And the re reason why I am going to do this shout out is because. So Cecilia would always ask me what's coming up next, what's coming next, and I always respond, oh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, because I had everything written out. I have a schedule, you know, it's not a it, it's not a do or die schedule, it's not a schedule, it's a schedule that changes every day, every second, I'm always changing it, always switching dates around, but it's a schedule that allows me to, to stay focused and, and, and maintain some sort of discipline with uploading videos, and I just thought, hey, why don't I just upload my schedule and you can look at it and it you know so you can get an idea of the craziness that is going on in my mind when it comes to creating videos for this channel i mean there's so much content there's so much content i want to make and the issue is i don't have enough time to do it all trust me if it was up to me i'd be, this would be my nine to five i would be busting out videos every day coming up with some really cool content but i realistically i don't have that time you know at most i have an hour to two hours a day if that if i do get to sit down and and work on this channel it's very hard to work on this channel outside of um home you know when i'm at work there's i can do youtube stuff i can like respond to comments and you know f fix my tags and fix my descriptions but the actual recording of the gameplay and recording of the audio and editing an iMovie and editing with quick time and making stuff with photoshop all that stuff i can do at home so creating the schedule allows me to stay focused stay on task so if you check in my youtube banner there's a link 
There's a link to my Google Docs where I have my Be Better Gamer Wrestling schedule. It's very bare bones. I'm actually going to have to fix my schedule the way it looks because now that people can look at it, I want it to be, you know, a little bit more legible and, and you know, so that people can understand where I'm going with my channel. And again, it changes all the time. I'll change the wrestlers I'm going to work on, change the video ideas I'm going to work on, the calls I'm going to make. I just put it in there as placeholders so it at least, you know, keeps me focusing on task. And if I do spend too much time changing my mind, it's like, no, you got a video that you got to put up. And the dates, the dates also, you know, I've been very good. I was very good in the month of June. I didn't miss a single date that I set. In July, I had to move a few dates around. Um, but only like two, only two videos were delayed and I only put them up the next day. So that's good. That's good for me. That's progress for me. So Cecilia Pisano, thank you so much for asking me what I'm doing all the time, because you know what? It allows me to check in with myself and say, yeah, what am I doing? What am I working on? Do I have this plan? Do I have who my next hardcore championship let's play is going to be? Who am I going to do for my tag team championship? I got to make sure I have all this stuff down because before you know it, a week will pass, two weeks will pass, and I need that content on my channel. So Cecilia Pisano, always one of the first people to comment. Puts up a lot of good comments, a lot of great questions. So thank you so much. So and and because of you, I am giving another great benefit to my subscribers, and that's getting into the mind of how Be Better Gamer Wrestling operates with my very um, crude schedule, if you will. So anyway, let's get back to Taker. So here I am facing Kurt Angle on the on the uh, entrance to the SmackDown set. One of my favorite places to wrestle in WWF No Mercy in terms of like fighting in front of the arenas and fighting backstage. I love fighting at the uh, SmackDown entrance. It's just the look, the old SmackDown, you know, set design. I always really enjoyed it, um, you know, and just the, the, the way the grading looks. It's just really cool. All the way on to the right side, it goes very deep. You have a very long amount to run all the way to the right. Let's see if I end up taking Kurt Angle towards that direction. And uh, it's also a great place to give someone a last ride. It's also a great place to give someone a tombstone pile driver. But again, they took out they didn't take out Undertaker's Tombstone Pile Driver because you can still do it as Kane. You can, if you create a wrestler, you can use the move. But Undertaker can't do it as his special because it's only available as a special move. And instead, they gave him the last ride power bomb, and the last ride was what he would use pretty much all the time when he was this new Undertaker, this gimmick the that, that would become to be known as the American Badass. Dead Man Inc. was another nickname for it. It was basically this cool biker version of The Undertaker. The Undertaker making his debut as The Undertaker in the 1990 Survivor Series. And for nearly a decade, he was The Undertaker, the, the, the dead man. You know, and then eventually in the beginnings of the Attitude Era, he would transform into like this Ministry of Darkness, this more gothic very sinister version of the undertaker very probably the most extreme version of the undertaker that he ever went but then he took some time off to i believe to injury and he came back at judgment day 01 um as the new american badass and he interfered at the end of the the rock triple h iron man match it was tied up the timer was counting down. You could tell there was a little bit of a mess up with the timer and Undertaker's interference. They probably didn't time it as well as they could have. But whatever. The, the, the point was still made. The Undertaker was back. And he came riding in at a, in a motorcycle. And everyone was losing their mind. Because they had never seen The Undertaker like that before. And not only that, but it was like, you know. It was his... It was his... Uh, it was his big return. And, you know, he, he comes riding in on the motorcycle. He interferes. He interferes at the end. Beats up the entire, like, you know, McMahon, Helmsley faction. You know, Vince McMahon and the Stooges and all of that. So he comes in. And it was, it was pretty epic. It was pretty badass. No pun intended. Comes in with this trench coat and on the bike and the glasses. And he's just wrecking everyone. But... He interferes in the match, so Shawn Michaels, who's the guest referee, calls it a DQ. And, you know, that gives Triple H another point. And boom, 
uh, uh, Triple H retains the title. So a lot of controversy there with the Iron Man match. That Iron Man match, that ending to that Iron Man match, I feel like uh, made a lot of people sore because, yeah, it was great to see the Undertaker back. But then, you know, The Rock, The Rock had it won. He could have won it. Um, and, you know, because of Taker's interference, it was ruled against him. So you think it would start this big, long feud with Undertaker and Triple H and The Rock. And it kind of did and it kind of didn't. And Undertaker uh, would reunite with Kane. Uh, and they would, f you know, reform the Brothers of Destruction in a way. Uh, he would feud a bit with Triple H, obviously facing him at WrestleMania. Having that first WrestleMania match with Triple H before later on the more recent you know back-to-back -back triple h wrestlemania matches and eventually he would get to you know the point where he became the hardcore champion you know he and it, it was it was again it was another one of those instances where well you know it was coming off the heels i talked about this in my rob van dam hardcore championship let's play rob van dam in my opinion looking back at it all rob van dam had the best Hardcore championship run or at least my favorite hardcore championship run. I shouldn't say the best. That's very subjective So I'm gonna say he had my favorite hardcore championship run because I feel like he elevated the hardcore championship And it's crazy to think that he would lose the title to the Undertaker now the Undertaker So, you know after coming back as the American badass, you know ro coming in on the, the the motorcycle and you got Limp Bizkit rolling playing in the background eventually it would change to I think uh what was it Kid Rock Kid Rock's American badass obviously um and he would he would lose the title to the Undertaker because the Undertaker at that after the after the invasion storyline was all said and done uh Undertaker turned heel so he came back as a babyface at Judgment Day 2000, 2000, I think I said 2001 earlier, that was a mistake, 2000, I don't know what I'm thinking, because Judgment Day 2000, because obviously they put it in another way, no mercy, get your years right, be better gamer, uh, <laughs> you know, he would have his brief feud with the Kane, and then team up with Kane, and a brief feud with Kurt Angle, and then he'd be in the Hell in a Cell, and all that jazz, but after the Invasion Angle, he would turn heel, during like a kiss my ass segment and he would attack Jim Ross who was supposed to kiss Vince McMahon's ass and Undertaker coming out thinking oh Undertaker's gonna stand up for Jim Ross against Vince McMahon and Kurt Angle but no instead he attacks Jim Ross and then he goes uh running around saying that you know he demands respect because he's been there for so long he's been there for 11 years he demands respect and he's gonna earn it he's gonna beat the respect out of people because what better way to get respect than to beat it out of someone? Pretty sure everyone, I'm pretty sure uh, everyone uh, respected the Undertaker, but he just had some this weird complex. But it was great. I loved it. I loved seeing the Undertaker. It was such a drastic change from you know being the dead man, being this you know almost fantastical if you will kind of character and especially the fact that he was able to transition into the ministry of darkness during the the early attitude era was good but this undertaker fit more of what was going on at the time in wrestling and you know it's always good to change up who you are every now and then to you know kind of um he was still undertaker but it was just with a fresh coat of paint if you will and he did it very well, and I think the American Badass gimmick is a little underrated in that sense because I really feel like it got to show a lot more of Undertaker's personality, and if you really think about it, we probably relate much more to him now because of those years he spent as, you know, the American Badass. At, you know, you had the whole uh, when DDP came in and he started going after Undertaker's then wife. Um, you know, you, you, he's coming around, he's riding on a motorcycle, you can see all his tattoos, and, you know, he's just, it was just a lot more human. And, you know, it was still the Undertaker of old, he could still do all his moves, he, uh, you know, adopted a few new things, he adopted a more hard-hitting brawler style, you know, and it allowed him to, I feel like, to connect more with the audience, to be a little bit more realistic in the terms of all the other characters that were, uh, you know, moving in a more realistic direction, 
And he rose instantly to the top. I mean, Undertaker was always a top guy. Undertaker coming in, like, in, you know, his first year winning the title from Hogan. Um, so he, it's not like he ever really dropped down. But I think also being around for 10 years and being this new Undertaker, it also allowed him to work with a lot of the new up-and-comers and not have it to be about the World Heavyweight Championship or not have it to be a top-level feud. And I think this whole running around, earning his respect, going after a lot of the younger you know, guys, a lot of the newer faces in WWE that came over from the invasion, uh, I loved it. I thought it was great. It was great to see that sort of aggression from The Undertaker because it wasn't about like, oh, I'm going to beat you up and sacrifice you to the demon and the gods you know which is fun you know it's fun it's in own way but it's like you know this was a lot more aggressive it was a lot more grounded in probably who Undertaker really was as a person you know Undertaker always has a history of being this you know the the the, the general of the WWE locker room one of the big leaders of the WWE locker room and I would have to imagine he's also probably legitimately one of the toughest guys around so you wouldn't want to get on Taker's bad side. And a lot of people have talked about stories about wrestlers getting on Taker's bad side. And it's never really a good thing. It never really works out for the other party. And so he was going around beating everyone up. And he ended up attacking Rob Van Dam, who was the hardcore champion at the time. And RVD was the first guy to like, yo, I'm not going to put up with that. And he, he, he repaid the favor to The Undertaker. He repaid the favor to The Undertaker, attacking Undertaker, you know, after a match. Uh, and that set up their hardcore championship match at, what was it, Unforgiven? Come on. Yeah, right? Unforgiven. I just talked about it last hardcore championship. You think I would remember? It's Vengeance. Vengeance 2001. See, this is why I write everything down. This is why I had to write, you know, I was supposed to give the shout out to Cecilia last Let's Play, and I didn't write it down, so I forgot. You know, I watch so much wrestling all the time. It all just becomes one jumbled mess. I got to write these things down. Or otherwise, I forget saying a taker came back at Judgment Day 2001. Come on, he came back at 2000. You know, <laughs> Vengeance. Vengeance 2001 Hardcore Championship match. This is why I write stuff down. I talked about this in my last Hardcore Championship. The Rob Van Dam and Undertaker Championship match was great and it was awesome to see Rob Van Dam against The Undertaker for just a hardcore championship. A hardcore championship, you know, Undertaker never held the Intercontinental Championship. He never held the US Heavyweight Championship. He never held the European Championship and that's mainly because he was always kept in the World Championship picture. He you know, he was uh, he's a he was a, before you know, at this time when he when he won the Hardcore Championship, he was a three-time WWE Champion. He would go on to become a three-time World Champion and win another fourth WWE Championship. You know, Tag Team Championship with Kane. But Undertaker didn't need to, to you know, face off in the second-tier titles because he was always involved in the main title picture. But it was still awesome to see him win the Hardcore Championship because, again, it gave it, it gave a sense of importance. It gave a sense of weight. Like, here's The Undertaker. Robin Dam already elevated to a point where he was able to get involved in a match with The Undertaker for a Hardcore Championship. But now Undertaker actually won it. And he should have won it, rightly so. I mean, Undertaker, at that time... Clearly, he was going to beat Rob Van Dam, but it just helped, not only it helped establish the story of, oh, now he's going to do whatever the hell he wants, because with the Hardcore Championship, all the matches now are going to be hardcore, so now Undertaker can definitely inflict as much pain and punishment as he wants to anyone, but it also just helped put it on another level, because again, Undertaker is a top-tier guy, top-tier, you know, you know, so... When you look at Undertaker's Hardcore Championship run, it's unique in the sense that, you know, he was a world champion who won the Hardcore Championship. But also, you know, I think that's where it kind of went back down after he would lose it. You know, obviously no one was going to challenge Undertaker to a 24-7 rule, which was awesome. Which was another great way to kind of pump the brakes on the 24-7 you know, stipulation because really who's going to be stupid enough to attack The Undertaker 24-7 because you know you know he's going to come after you. And same thing with Av Rob Van Dam. Rob Van Dam barely got attacked with the 24-7. He usually only got attacked by people he was feuding with who were trying to take advantage of the 24-7 rule just so they can get a one-up on RVD. But The Undertaker with the 24-7, no one was going to challenge him. You know, it's like if Brock Lesnar had the Hardcore Championship. Who's going to challenge Brock Lesnar? Who's going to try to 
attack Brock Lesnar when he's not looking. Because even if you do manage to keep him down just enough to get the pin, you're going to have to leave the country to, <laughs> to avoid the punishment that's going to happen when Brock Lesnar gets his hands back on. Because what's, what's, what's more dangerous than attacking someone like Undertaker in a 24-7 stipulation is now you have to be on the lookout for Undertaker in a 24-7 stipulation. So a great, great way to really elevate the hardcore championship, you know, looking back on it. And also looking back on it, it really, it kind of went down after that. So the whole... The whole lead in to Undertaker winning the championship was this whole I demand respect, da, da, da. you know, I get respect from RVD by choke slamming him off the, you know, stage. So then he would, you know, beat a bunch of other people. He fought Spike Dudley, Jeff Hardy, Matt Hardy, Tajiri, even Big Show. He would have a brief feud with Big Show over the hardcore championship. Um, so he had all these hardcore championship matches where he was demanding respect, but really the, t the tipping point was. Uh, the Royal Rumble, Royal Rumble 2002, Undertaker comes in after, you know, I think Jeff Hardy or Matt Hardy, one of the Hardys, or maybe it was Maven, I forget who he came after, but Maven was there, the Hardys were there, and Undertaker comes in, Undertaker comes in, he uh, pretty much helps eliminate the Hardys, and the Hardys try to come back into the ring, and beat up the Undertaker because they're upset with the Undertaker, and they've also been kind of beefing with the Undertaker, so, uh, Undertaker, you know, gets them out of the ring, and out of nowhere, Maven, with one of the prettiest drop kicks I've ever seen, Maven had a really good drop kick. Maven, the first ever tough enough winner, <laughs> he drop kicks Undertaker and eliminates the Undertaker. Everyone loses their mind. I remember watching it, and I was like, that's incredible. Like, Maven eliminates the Undertaker. Like, if you want to establish this winner of this tough enough contest which i have to admit i watched the whole first season of i was every week watching tough enough on mtv uh don't blame me uh, i was really into it never watched another one since um so at least there's that and maven eliminates the undertaker and the look on undertaker's face was just priceless and then the look on Maven's face was probably just like, oh, what did I do? What did, what did I do? Undertaker goes back in there, beats him up. I believe he eliminates him. Um, and that set up a brief Undertaker-Maven feud. You know, Undertaker, you got to give him so much credit. Because, you know, that's also a perfect example of a, an established veteran, uh, of a star, to helping build momentum around a new a new performer and I think that goes into part of Undertaker's longevity um, you know a lot of people always complain about certain wrestlers not putting people over and I'm sure there's a lot of truth to that I mean there's definitely a lot of truth and examples of guys like Hogan or Triple H or whatever in moments in their career you know moments in their career where they definitely probably should have let the other guy win because it would have helped them a little bit because at the end of the day Undertaker getting eliminated by Maven in the Royal Rumble. Then Undertaker eventually losing the Hardcore Championship to Maven. Um, Undertaker's still here. Undertaker's still probably as more popular than he's ever been. You know what I mean? Like, you know, where's Maven? Unfortunately, Maven's not in WWE anymore. Unfortunately, Maven didn't have the long, you know, illustrious career. But, you know, in that moment, for those few weeks... It really helped him. It really helped him, and you know when you when a, when someone's given because it goes both ways. I'm of the feeling it goes both ways. A lot of people like to come. Oh, so and so should have won because it would have helped them. Okay, yeah, it would have helped them. Yes, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's gonna be their you know golden ticket to fade and superstardom just because you get a big victory over an established veteran or a superstar doesn't mean that you're all of a sudden going to be main event all of a sudden you're going to be big time status there's been so many wrestlers who have gotten the rub from so many other you know more popular more famous more established guys and once they're given the ball honestly they don't run with it you know, they don't do anything after they don't do anything after the fact to show that they were worthy of that opportunity or that, you know, they blow it on their own personal, you know, and their demons hold them back. You could even make arguments for guys like Jeff Hardy and Rob Van Dam, who 
at the prime and the height of their popularity in WWE, they kind of blew it for themselves, you know, behind the scenes. Um, you know, it, so it, it goes both ways. And, you know, you can't take anything away from the Undertaker because he looks good throughout all of it. It's like, yeah, I gave the rub to Maven. All right, you know, good luck, kid. Now you're on your own. I helped you out. You know, show everyone that you deserve this opportunity. Show everyone that you can be the next great hardcore champion. He wasn't. You know, <laughs> you know, Maven would lose it uh, under 24-7 rules. At least he would lose it the rest of the way. And yeah, of course, a lot of it had to do with tough enough they really wanted to help establish the whole show and the fact that the winner was now you know in the forefront of the wwe limelight and doing some stuff but at the end of the day you know it's it, it goes to show that sometimes you need more you need more and that's not a knock against maven i thought maven uh was a very serviceable winner he, he was my like i said i watched all of the first season of tough enough and i remember really liking josh back then josh matthews was still around still you know he's uh commentating for uh impact wrestling tna uh, i believe still and um you know, he did some commentary work for WWE. But I was really rooting for Josh because obviously he was a smaller guy. He was the undersized guy. He was a wrestling fan. He was a big wrestling fan. And that really appealed to me. A lot of my other favorites quit. I mean, I remember the funny thing. The, the great thing, I do have to say, the great thing about that first Tough Enough is that it really did make, it really did show how hard wrestling was because most of the competitors quit. It was like three people who actually got eliminated because of votes. But pretty much everyone quit. Like in the first episode, I think someone quit, if I remember correctly. Like the first or second episode, someone quit. So I really enjoyed that aspect of it because it really got to show how tough and how serious WWE was taking it because, you know, they were really putting them through the grind of becoming a professional wrestler. And, you know, they had to train these people in such a small amount of time. So they had to, you know... Um, overload them even more and then you know they weren't you know playing nice i remember triple h coming in and talking crap you know and i think you know was taz in that first season i think taz, no i don't remember if taz i think taz made a cameo that first season he would become a trainer later on if i believe um it was who was it it was al snow ivory jackie and someone else maybe it was taz maybe taz was a see i don't see this is why i should write this stuff down because i don't remember uh i'm still fighting the apa APA won't go down. How many last rides and choke slams have I given the APA? I should also mention, I should have mentioned this in the beginning of my video. I'm almost done with this video, but I should mention that I did adjust the Undertaker attire because this attire was more closely to what he wore uh, in the match with RVD and what he would wear, you know, continuously as his, um, you know, Dead Man Inc. gimmick, as his American Badass gimmick. So let's go back to, let's go back to my feelings on undertaker as a character in this game so obviously they went in the direction with the american badass you know if you think about it so judgment day 2000 you know let's get it right was in may of 2000 no mercy came out in november of 2000 so you got to think they probably finished the game august september you know, like in terms of like, all right, we can't add anything more because we got to, you know, debug the game and we got to get this thing out. So maybe August, September, or maybe even earlier than that, you know, maybe July was the cutoff. Who knows? But May 31, that still was enough time for them to get the Undertaker in the game. A few things. So uh, they gave him the raw entrance theme as the default theme right when you come in. Which was weird, but if you go into the, the the music, there's a there's one of the songs. I think it's original four. Is basically like a very a very uh, bootleg version of what's supposed to be the Undertaker's theme because it has the gongs. It starts out with the gongs and then and then it comes out with like this really you know really crude version of I'm guessing it's supposed to be Roland. Um, but that's obviously supposed to be the Undertaker's thing. Maybe they didn't have. Maybe they made that as a placeholder, and maybe they were trying to get the rights to Roland, and they couldn't. Who knows? That's a, that's a very interesting thing to, to you know try to find out. You know, this has to be the last last ride. I've last ride the APA so many times, and finally I'm putting them away. This this handicap 
APA hardcore match that you always fight in these hardcore championship hats is, is sometimes one of the most grueling and challenging matches to do just because it just seems like it takes forever to beat them. All my APA handicap matches usually end up being like 10 minutes long, but there we go. Two more chapters left. So he's got the raw entrance music, which is like, well, why didn't you just put the original music? Because the original music actually lines up to the Titantron better. You know, with the gong and how, you know, with the little, with the little girls, he's here. And then it would show The Undertaker. So the, the, that lines up better. His outfit is weird. Like, it's, I just feel like it's, they could have done a better job with the outfit. You know, it's a little all over the place. The jeans and the flannel. It's not, it's not the best it could be. Um, and I don't even think he enters with his biker and flannel as the default. I can't remember that now because I already changed it. So I can't remember if he already had it as the default. But yeah, so you got to do a lot of adjustments to The Undertaker. And this is also a perfect example of why I felt like they should have kept the Super Special from Virtual Pro Wrestling 2. So if you've played Virtual Pro Wrestling 2, if you've seen my you know videos on Virtual Pro Wrestling 2, you know that in that game, which came out before um, WWF No Mercy, came out at the beginning of 2000. It was a follow-up to WrestleMania 2000, released shortly after WrestleMania 2000, and only released in Japan, has all the Japanese wrestlers, Virtual Pro Wrestling 2. In it, you can do a super special. So basically, when you have your special, and you do your taunt, and you got your special meter going, if you do another taunt, you unlock a super special, and the super special, it's like half the time is available for the regular special so it's a you only have like pretty much one chance to do it so don't blow it and then you can't do it ever again in that match so if you do hit your super special and if you don't manage to get the pin or the submission whatever it may be um you can't do it again the next time you get a special you can't hit the taunt again and do it the next time so it was really cool because a lot of the japanese wrestlers in the game they had those big epic finishing you know super finishing moves like all right no one's kicking out of the emerald you know fusion flosion you know however you want to call it for mitsuhiro masawa no one's kicking out of the burning hammer you know these were all like the big super specials for the wrestlers and in wwf no mercy if you really think about it there's really no one kind of who would use that if the exception of maybe taz but it's not really that important that he doesn't have it but i feel like with undertaker it's definitely important because you could have given him the last ride as his special and then as the super special you could have given him the tombstone pile driver also like you should have just kept it in for creative wrestlers you know like I, I don't know why they took that out because i think that would have been something great to keep in just you know for creative wrestlers like you don't have to have you know it's it's like the whole concept of like there's moves in the game that no wrestlers on the roster uses you know so like but they still Put it in the game for your creative wrestler you know it would be it would be a shame if they took that out like they're only going to keep moves in there that the wrestlers use and then you know have that only available for creative wrestlers so i don't know why they took that creative wrestler feature out i don't know why they took a lot of creative wrestler features out you know there's a lot of the mask option that you can do a lot of the ring attire and and you know attire is gone and like basic stuff stuff that isn't even like you know trademark stuff they took out and i just don't i just don't understand that but whatever but that's the that's my only issue with the undertaker in this game honestly because i love the tombstone pile driver you know and i'd much rather play with undertaker than kane in this game because i like undertaker's move set more he's got that running jumping clothesline he's got the big diving spat slash to the outside he's got the old school you know rope walk specific to him it's got a lot of cool stuff it's got a great reg you know the great regular choke slam um you know and and the last ride's awesome like you know don't make me choose give me both <laughs> that's the only that's the only thing with the undertaker it really highlights um how you know how much needed um the virtual pro wrestling 2 super special was honestly because you know you think about you think about a lot of the other wrestlers and again it's very hard i say taz because taz you know his back special obviously you want it to be the taz mission you know they have the reverse taz plex in there you could have put that as a super special um you know i'm trying to think there's not really many other guys in the game if you could think of anyone that's already in wwf no mercy that would have benefited 
from the super special you know put it in the comments let me know because i'm drawing a blank right now i'm sure maybe there might be one or two other people but uh definitely undertaker is the number one definitely undertaker the fact that you can't do the iconic tombstone pile driver you know and he also has the pin the dead man pin you know where you fold up the arms and then he you know lifts his head up and it's still in the game it's still in here and that was what he did in wrestlemania 2000 that's how i pretty much won all my matches in wrestlemania 2000 with the undertaker you would do the tombstone pile driver and then you'd follow it up with the special pin such a cool way to win um so yeah that's 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 pretty much it with the Undertaker's Hardcore Championship run, you know, and that's why I say my favorite is still Rob Van Dam because even though I loved how much Undertaker having the championship and what it means to him, again, just like Mankind, I talked about it in my first Hardcore Championship Let's Play with Mankind. Undertaker was doing Hardcore ch matches before Hardcore Championship, you know, the Hardcore Championship even was a thing, and our, and, and he would still do Hardcore matches just just. Even at the end of that feud with Maven. So he would lose the match mainly because The Rock would interfere. If you don't remember. The Rock would come in, interfere. The whole reason why Undertaker fought Maven is because he wanted to prove a point And The Rock was making fun of him. So, so he attacked The Rock in a match. And cost The Rock his number one contendership. So then when, the, when Undertaker faced Maven. The Rock came in and cost Maven to lose his hardcore championship. And it was really more so the embarrassment. I'm sure Undertaker could care less if he was Hardcore Championship or not. But it was more so the embarrassment. And that set up Undertaker and The Rock feuding. And then in that match, Ric Flair would cause Undertaker to lose. And that would set up uh, one of my favorite Undertaker WrestleMania matches. I feel like it's an underrated Undertaker match at WrestleMania. It was Undertaker against uh, Ric Flair at WrestleMania 18. 18? Yeah, 18. See, I wrote that down. Uh... And it was a no DQ match. It was a no DQ match. So here he is. He's not hardcore championship anymore. He's still having hardcore, you know, rules matches. So, and he's the king of the Hell in a Cell. Undertaker would be involved in so many other Hell in a Cell matches. Casket match. Buried Alive match. He, you know, hardcore, he, hardcore goes hand in hand with The Undertaker. Just like how hardcore goes hand in hand with Mankind. Um, you know, so it's not like he needed the Hardcore Championship to establish, but I think it was just more so than the Intercontinental Championship and the U.S. Heavyweight Championship. It kind of makes sense that Undertaker was the Hardcore Champion at one point. Because the dude was known for having Hardcore matches, you know, being in the first Hell in the Cell. You know, even recently, he was in two Hell in the Cells within a year almost, pretty much. You know what I mean? Within 12 months, I should say. Because he was in the Hell in a Cell match with Brock Lesnar. And then at WrestleMania, he was in the Hell in a Cell match with Shane McMahon. He'll probably be in one more Hell in a Cell match before he retires. Um, so, you know, Undertaker being the hardcore champion. You know, again, it's the kind of thing that if the hardcore championship were to come back, I wouldn't want it to be 24-7. I would, I would want it to be with guys who just aren't just like, you know, all, all they do is hardcore but they could just go in those styles of matches. The reason why I say the Ric Flair match I feel like is a very underrated match. And it's one of my personal favorite uh, Ric Flair uh, Undertaker WrestleMania matches. Is because it was just a straight up old school brawl. You know, just straight up. And Ric Flair was involved in a ton of those in the 80s. You know, and, and, and early 90s. And... Um, it was just an, an Undertaker, you know, he's old school, man. He's from that time period. He was, he was trained in that time period, I should say. And, you know, he, he, he follows that mentality. So to just see him and Ric Flair go at it, just punching the crap at each other. And Ric Flair was busted open. It was very, it was very you know, Southern style wrestling. Very, very just, we're going to brawl. We're going to beat each other up. No nonsense. Also has one of my favorite moments of all time in wrestling. And that's... Art Anderson popping out of nowhere with that spine buster. I remember reading an article one time and they, you know, related it to like a uh, Marvel versus Capcom, you know, kind of assist, character assist. Like all of a sudden Art Anderson just shows up and hits his character assist and just leaves. Such a great moment because Art Anderson, you know, being retired and always saying how like he probably has one more match in him. We never got that one more match with Art Anderson, which is a shame. But it was just a beautiful moment. Loved it. But anyway, another another hardcore gem, you know, that wasn't 
surrounding the hardcore championship and that was kind of a shame you know that's always been that's just and it just all kind of goes downhill after the undertaker i feel you know it never really gets back to those fun exciting moments of when the hardcore championship was under the 24 7 rules or having some top tier guys like rvd and undertaker holding it but that's why i wanted to take the time out to do undertaker for this hardcore championship show the american badass talk about his time as hardcore championship definitely one of the highlights and there you go another hardcore championship video in the bag I hope you like this video. As always, like, comment, and subscribe. Once again, another shout out to Cecilia Pisano. Check out my schedule so you know what videos are coming up soon. And yeah, that's it. As always, I'm Be Better Gamer. And until next time, keep watching all the wrestling. Thank you.